first uh, Living Springs uh, preach on uh, Facebook via Zoom. Uh, if you're a visitor today, we really welcome you. Um, my name is Nigel. I'm one of the leaders at Living Springs. And we're just going to be sharing a continuing thoughts this morning with regard to the character of God. And you can probably hear the telephone in the background, which is a bit of a pain. Okay, they'll pick that up now. Great. <clears throat> so welcome. Um, in these very unsettled and uncertain times, I suppose there is nothing more appropriate and pertinent than for us to be considering some of the characteristics of God. Indeed, as we look at wisdom and faithfulness as being of two of God's key characteristics, clearly in this these times, and I'm just looking out of my window at how quiet the world is and how devastated we have been by recent events, then clearly wisdom and faithfulness are qualities that the world is desperately looking for. So how can we see that these, in, that these are in fact qualities that God himself demonstrates? Let's have a, let's have a look at, at, at these two things. The, you know, the word of God speaks to us so much about his qualities. And Adam spoke of trust last week, and, and quite rightly. And, and trust and, and faithfulness often go closely hand in hand. So what can we say about faithfulness? Um, uh, the, you know, this, this faithfulness of God. God is faithful. You know, when you think of faithfulness, really, it's faithfulness we're looking at, sorry. Um, when we think of faithfulness, I think the first thing that comes to mind, uh, be it appropriate or not, is, is about dogs. Because when you think of uh, faithfulness, there's nothing more faithful than a trustworthy, than a faithful dog. That they, they have this, um, this phrase that's bandied about these days, unconditional positive regard. They tend to, to give you that whatever, don't they? They are absolutely uh, glued to you. They are consistent. Uh, they love you no matter what, whether they're fed on time or not fed on time. Adam can relate to this more recently because obviously he's got a dog now. Uh, but there's that sense of faithfulness, that sense of always being there. And, you know, it, it's difficult, I think, for people sometimes to, to relate to a faithful God when we live in a world that lacks that quality so distinctly. And why is that? I think, quite, quite, to be quite honest, uh, our faithfulness is undermined by self-interest. Just think about that for a moment. Our faithfulness is often undermined by our own self-interest. And what I mean by that is, what matters most for Nigel Biddle will often drive Nigel Biddle's behaviours. What matters most for Nigel Biddle will often drive what not Nigel Biddle will be doing during the day, how well Nigel might be doing something, how well I might apply myself to things. Because actually, unfortunately, the nature of self is that we're driven by self-interest. But, and then the unfortunate thing is, quite often we look at God and think, well, perhaps he looks at me in the same way. And then we, we condemn ourselves because of how we look at ourselves. However, what does the word of God tell us about God, him, and how he looks at his faithfulness? If you've got your Bibles, you could turn to 1 John 1 and verse 9. And this is a, these are verses that are pertinent, specific, particularly to Christians, but also to everyone, whether they know the Lord or don't know the Lord. When we look at our lives and think, actually, why should God, why should a God of perfection take any interest in me, a person of so, so many imperfections? 
And in 1 John 1, 9, you'll have found it by now. It, it will say this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, it says, he is faithful and just. In, in other words, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter what sin we may have committed, no matter how we may be condemning ourselves because of our, uh, our lifestyle, because of the things we have done, perhaps because of the things we've failed to do, even this very week, we might look back on our lives and think, actually, I'm not the person that God would have wanted me to be this week. There's been a lot of Nigel Biddle coming out of me. There's a lot of self been coming out and not so much of the Lord Jesus Christ and his character. But we need to take assurance that the God we serve loves us and is faithful. And is faithful if we're sincere. It, you know, this verse speaks about sincerity. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just one for forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. And you might say, well, how do I know that? How do I know that um, I haven't reached the limit of God's faithfulness? You know, in the, in the natural world, we all have limits, don't we? But there's, there's, a, there's a line, that in, in our, whether it be in our relationships with others, in our marriages, in our workplaces, that sometimes we cross that means actually uh, as much as people might have been faithful and trusted us and gone with us, it crosses, we cross that line. And that's it then. That they've sort of, that's it. You've overstepped the mark. How do we know that God isn't like that? That I haven't overstepped the mark? You know, sometimes when we look at our lives and we look at times at the mess we've made of them or the things that we have done that we deeply regret. But as we've said perhaps in the past, sometimes you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You can't undo those things you have done. Surely I have overstepped the mark with God. Well, let me turn you to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13. And this is a lovely verse because it speaks of God's character and his innate quality as God. It says there, 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He, he cannot deny himself. And this is a little like Adam brought out in his preaching in previous weeks around the character of God. God cannot deny his own character. It is an innate characteristic. He can't simply set that quality, that characteristic to one side and say, well, actually, Nigel, you've gone for you. I'm going to make an exception. No, Jan might say that to me. But, but God can't say that to me because to do so would deny his very person, the person of who he is. And we know that God is unchangeable. The word of God tells us in Hebrews, he is the same yesterday today and forever and it is that consistency that faithfulness that is i would say unique to god himself there is no one no person on earth no man-made idol no fantasy uh, uh, created by man that has the this quality of complete and utter faithfulness because it is the innate character of God. As the word there says, he cannot deny himself. So as we come to him, he's faithful to forgive us. As we come to him, his love is consistent. His love is not dependent on our actions, on our works on our love towards him on our, our uh, recognition by our peers or by members of the congregation within the church 
His love is unconditional. It is, it is 100%, 100% of the time. This is the faithfulness of God. Faithfulness of God does not mean that he will smooth out every bump in the road. The faithfulness does, does not, of God does not mean he is going to whisk me away from this coronavirus situation and I'm going to be placed in some idyllic little cloud, maybe sitting on a cloud while everyone else is going through the mire. That, that is not the case. Because actually, friends, sometimes we recognize the faithfulness of God most when we are going through the mill. And he brings us out the other side. Faithfulness is not tested when life is good. You know, I was reading... I was reading last night about people in Italy and I was moved because it spoke of parents in hospital who would be dying and their children could not be with them. Could not be with them. How desperate is that? But let me tell you, I know and you know, if you know the Lord, there is not a moment where God will not be with you. As he said to his apostles, I am with you always, Lord, to the ends of the earth. This is the faithfulness of our God. This is the God we serve. This is the God who loves us with a love that I cannot express. My words are inadequate to demonstrate, to to, to communicate the faithfulness and the love of God that we receive and yet perhaps don't actually fully appreciate or grasp. Our God's faithfulness is truly amazing. And let me say, in the midst of these trials, I would want to be in no other place than in relationship with the living God. Because whatever happens, I know God is faithful. And I would rather be in relationship with him than outside of it in these very circumstances. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, as I'm sharing this message, I would say to you, come to the one who is faithful. Come to the one who would not reject you. Come to the one who accepts you as you are. Right now, right in the here and now, not for the person you might become or that you could be, but who you are. Because God remains faithful and he cannot deny himself. And what else did we speak of? We talked about not just faithfulness of God, but his wisdom. Well, wisdom. Wisdom. You know, uh, we could do with some of that in this current time, couldn't we? You know, if people, people's um, perspective on wisdom is, is very varied, isn't it? And one person's wisdom is another man's foolishness. But it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 25, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. There's a massive difference between what the world considers to be wise and what God would consider to be wise. And we can see that in the behaviours recently. You know, no matter what um, uh, advice might be given in our current situation, I was looking at, uh, last night Bondi Beach. Bondi Beach was rammed in Australia. Rammed, what's that about? Where's the wisdom in that? They had to close the beaches. There was a holiday resort in the UK, and I can't remember where it was now, but it was full of people. Where is the wisdom in that? The wisdom of man and the wisdom of God are sometimes so far apart. 
that it's difficult for us to grasp that it actually makes sense. There's a wonderful, as, as, there's a wonderful passage that as Paul is speaking it's to the Corinthian church, or Roman church, sorry, Romans 11, that he's speaking to them. He speaks of the wisdom of God. In verse Romans 11 and verse 33, he says this. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. And there's paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And those are wonderful verses. As Paul recognises, this is God. This is one who does not see through a glass darkly, but sees past, present and future as one. How unsearchable his judgments, he says. The depth of the riches of his wisdom and the knowledge of God. And he compares that, in, compare that with Corinthians when, with our own view of things. And we, say, we read there this. This is us. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then, when we meet Christ, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You see, at the moment, particularly now, we cannot see the future. We cannot see what events may lie ahead. Our capacity to predict what, what, what steps to take, even in this crisis, is so difficult and limited. Even the scientific experts uh, recognise and state that their, their steps and methodologies uh, based on the models are best guesses. Scientific best guesses, admittedly, but it's best guesses. Their wisdom is limited. When we come to God... We come to a God whose wisdom is unlimited. Because when you have all knowledge, you have all wisdom. As that word, those words says, now I know in part. There's not one of us that can say, I know it all. I know it absolutely fully. But God does. God is the omniscient God. All knowing. And if you have all knowledge, then surely, then what you do is you act on the basis of that knowledge in real wisdom. Because without knowledge, it's difficult to apply wisdom because knowledge and wisdom are interesting things, aren't they? You know, may, maybe my, my definition might be, and I've, I've looked at a few as I've prepared for today, you know, that the wisdom is perhaps that application of knowledge, the effective right application of knowledge. So God being an all-knowing God that sees, as I've said earlier, past, present and future as one can operate with absolute and infinite wisdom, though we ourselves may not quite grasp that. But we ourselves may not quite see that. That what we see is through a glass darkly. And we think, what on earth is going on here? And as we look at our own lives, maybe our past, and we look at events that have taken place, we'll look and think, I still don't get that. I, I still don't get why that happened as it happened or why it happened when it happened 
or why it happened at all. And there will be events that are in our own minds inexplicable. Things that we have not, that that does not seem to be any rhyme or reason. But let me take you back to those verses in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It says, now I know in part, but then when we meet with him, I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. God's wisdom is indeed unsearchable. So, how does that have impact on us? How this wisdom and faithfulness, these are God qualities. These are not necessarily natural qualities for for ourselves. Um, Maybe now and again we make wise choices. Maybe now and again we make poor choices. I'll tell you what. One question that came to me as I was considering this whole matter, why are we so slow to ask his advice and guidance? (laughs) You know, um, so often we'll take maybe big decisions around our lives, huge steps, and we'll have done that on the basis of, well, my mate's advice, or actually I I, I spoke to this person because they've been through that. And we speak to, we seem to speak to all and sundry, and yet we don't speak to the one who knows it all. It says, James 1.5, I love James. James is a very practical book. You want to live practically. You want to live as a Christian in the real world. The book of James is phenomenal. So very simple. And I love the simplicity. This is not complex. It says here. I'm just looking at because I think James might get some more flowers. It says here <clears throat> in James 1 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask. Well, it doesn't say your neighbor. And fellas, it doesn't even ask, say, ask your wife. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. And it might you know, and then he goes on to say, how God gives it who gives generously to all without finding fault. And so it's not as if he's going to say, Nigel, I've been through this before with you. How many times are you going to keep bringing this same issue to me? I've told you time and time again. It says here to me, my reassurance is, who gives generously to all without finding fault? So he doesn't say to me, Nigel, how on earth did you get yourself into this mess? You've got yourself into this pickle. Sort yourself out, son. It says, without finding fault. And then it reassures me further. And it will be given to you. Can I encourage myself and yourselves? You know that if, if we know and are in relationship with God, then why on earth is he not our first port of call? Then we, when we need some true wisdom. Maybe it's because we find it hard to hear. You know that if, if I ask Jan for some advice, I can be pretty sure it's going to be pretty immediate. It may not be what I want to hear, but it'd be pretty immediate. And maybe that's that, it's that willingness to put ourselves in a place a, a, Adam said something to me some months ago that stuck in my mind, and it was about positioning, positioning. Perhaps we need to position ourselves so that when we ask of God, we can also hear from him. That when we ask of God, we place ourselves in a position to be able to hear from him. We... We set that quality of time time aside. You know, some of the skills we talk about in the work that I do is active listening. I wonder how much active listening we do in our relationship with God. Uh, We we might be good at active praying and active asking, but active listening, well, that's a different thing. Uh, How good am I at, at that, you know? 
do I, do I actually sit down and, and say to God, Lord, what do you want to say to me? What wisdom would you impart to my life? What word would you speak into my life? And I suppose that's one part of it. And then the other part is, how accepting am I going to be of the wisdom that God wants to give me? Because actually, it might not be what I want to hear. Uh, because his wisdom is a little bit different to my wisdom, as we've already heard. So there's a, there's a bit of humility that's required in order for the wisdom of God to be at work. You know, um, who would have thought Gideon would have been the one to rescue the people? You know, our mighty man of valor, as the angel said to him, uh, uh, you know, if God did sarcasm, uh, that would have been it, because he was hiding away, threshing, and uh, fundamentally at that point, he was probably a coward. But actually, he was used powerfully of God to demonstrate God's authority, God's power, God's grace. And if, if we're about self-promotion, then perhaps some of God's wisdom and God's root for us will not be forthcoming because there's some humility that's required, some time to submit to the wisdom of God. And that's a better heart attitude. You see, I suppose the greatest model of a heart attitude to the, the will, to the wisdom, to the faithfulness of God would be Jesus Christ himself. So here is God's son created to die. It means John the Baptist. First words from John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Here's Christ's sacrifice. And Christ himself has to absolutely trust in the wisdom of his Father. Have you got this right, Father, that I am coming to this lost world to live and die? to suffer for these that do not even consider you. He had to have absolute trust in God's faithfulness to keep him and God's wisdom to do what was right. And we have these wonderful prophetic words written in the book of Isaiah chapter 11, which prophetically I don't know how many hundreds of years ahead, speak of the character of Christ. And this is what they say, reading from verse 1 in Isaiah 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he, he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, I've lost a word here, he will, the needy, with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Hallelujah. The fear of the Lord, says, is the beginning of wisdom. Here, faithfulness, the sash around his waist. A spirit of wisdom and understanding. These are the very qualities that Christ himself demonstrated. 
And as Isaiah prophetically speaks of the Messiah that for him is yet to come, it also presents to us a challenge that this is the model. This is a model for us. This is the Lord himself who gave himself totally into his father's hands, trusted in the wisdom of his father, trusted in the faithfulness of his father to bring him through every circumstance and situation that he would face, to know at the end of it, he would indeed have conquered sin. So wisdom, something that every one of us needs. So we need to look no further than Christ and the model that he portrays to us. But I happened to find a verse, I thought, this is a great little verse. It is, a, if you like, a litmus test for wisdom. You want to test whether you're applying wisdom? Here's a wonderful verse. And let's go back to that book of James that I mentioned earlier. James 3 and verse 17. It says there, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So I thought to myself, this is a great little tester. Is what I'm doing wise? Is what I am saying real wisdom? Then here is the tester for me. Is it pure? Is it impartial? Is it motivated by self-interest? Or is it actually for the interest of others? Is it sincere? Or is it about a, 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 a veneer that I want to be seen by by others? Is it merciful? Is it peace-loving? You know, that is a fabulous verse. Let me recommend that as a, as a one to learn. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Do you want to test your wisdom, whether the decisions you're making are wise, whether the things that you're doing are wise, whether the, the things that you're saying are wise, there's the verse, there's the litmus test for your conversations, for your guidance to others, for the conduct of your life, for how we're living on a daily basis. And you know, in, the, in these times of the coronavirus and everything about it, if you used that very verse, to describe your actions and the way that you lived, then there would be food on the shelves in the supermarket. Then would no one out of self-interest would meet with someone else, knowing that they could put them at risk. No one would put self-interest above the interest of others. Because God's wisdom is pure. God's wisdom goes back to one of the previous qualities that we spoke of earlier, as Adam preached on a week or so ago. God is love. His wisdom is driven by love. It's motivated by love. Let me encourage us, friends, in closing, that... In these times where wisdom is in short supply and faithfulness might be temporary, that we can look to a God who has, has all wisdom and whose faithfulness knows no bounds. If you're a Christian this morning, you're in a blessed place. Because if you need advice and guidance and you need to seek a way forward, 
And God's the one to go to. First, second, and third. If you need to know, how am I going to get through this current circumstance? Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you this morning that your character is unchanging, that it is immaculate, that it is perfect. And we thank you, Lord, that as we look at Jesus Christ, he embodies your character. And when, Lord, we ask and recognize it, we, we recognize in ourselves, Lord, our weaknesses, our failings of character, our short falls, Lord, in so many ways. And we just pray that by your spirit, you will shape us and direct us and enable us to be men, women, children, full of the character of God. And I pray that in these days, in these days, as your church, we will shine forth as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. But Lord, we will know your faithfulness. We will trust in your wisdom. And if anyone is listening online this, this morning that doesn't know God, let me just say that in these most uncertain of times, now is the moment to turn to him. Now is the moment to invite him into your life that his faithfulness might indeed sustain you, that his wisdom might indeed direct your paths. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.